So now that we have types, we want to be able to write functions that act on those types. So for example, we want to write a width function, which can take a rectangle object and return me its width. But I don't want the width function to work on a complex number or an integer. So how can we do that? We actually write a function like this, width of r, but I give this type annotation. This type annotation operator is this two colons next to each other. r colon colon rectangle means that this width function takes one parameter called r, and that r has to be of type rectangle for this particular version of the width function. So then it's just a standard function definition in Julia. Here I've used the short form of a function definition. And then I can run that on this R object and I see that it returns its width. But if I try and run that function on, for example, the number three, then I get an error. It tells me there is no method that matches width. And here you see colon colon int 64. In other words, there is no version of this function which can receive a single integer because I have not defined any method that does that. And so that is the way that you can prevent people calling your code with objects that do not belong in there. On the other hand, it's very common in Julia to have specialized versions of functions that work on certain types and general or generic versions that work on any type. So as a simple example, let's think about a function called area we know how to calculate the area of a rectangle. It's its width times its height. So let's define that. Here it is. Um, we're using a type annotation to make sure that that version only works on a rectangle. In particular, the object that we're passing in must have fields called width and height for this code to even run. But we're also defining another method where we do not have a type annotation. That means that this code will work for any input value that I give it except for rectangles. So because the method that we just defined has a more specialized type signature, in other words, the sequence of types which I put into the function is called its signature, Julia will realize that when I pass in a rectangle, it should call that more specialized version. But when I pass in any other object, it will call this general version. So for example, if I call it on my rectangle, it correctly multiplies the width and height and calls the first method. Whereas if I pass in just an integer, it will just return that same value back to me. Of course, that's not necessarily ideal either. For example, area of the string hello will return hello. So you could complain, well, area should only be defined maybe for numbers, for example, and you can specify that in Julia as well. So what we're seeing is if I just write area, I can ask what is the function area? And it's telling me that it's what's called a generic function. So a function which can have many methods. And in this case, we have two methods. So each of these versions of the function is called a method. And if, for example, we later created a new type called circle, then we would also need a specialized method of the circle where it knew that the area should be pi r squared, for example, it's perfectly fine to define that new type and a method for the area function when I define that new type. And when I pass in a circle object, it will actually call that correct method. Just note that in Pluto right now, as of this recording, you actually need to put all the methods of a particular function together in one cell between begin and end. Uh, people often mention multiple dispatch when they talk about Julia. This is a very key concept in Julia. So what does that mean? Dispatch is just this process that we've been describing where you choose a different method or version of a function depending on what the input types are. And multiple dispatch means that you actually look at all of the input types for all of the arguments of your function to choose which method or version to call. So let's look at an example of that. Let's define a complex number, cc, 3 plus 4 m. That's how we define complex numbers in Julia. I m, m uh, stands for imaginary part. So that's basically what I would write in mathematics as 3 plus 4 times i, i being the square root of minus 1, or some engineers use j. In Julia, we use m so that we don't take over the symbol i 
so that you can use i and j in your program. And here we're taking 3 plus 4 times m, and that gives me a complex number. And now let's look at how to add complex numbers. So if I do cc plus cc, I get the new complex number, uh, 6 plus 8m, as I should. But how do I know what Julia is actually doing when it does that? So I can use this macro at which and type this, put give it this expression, cc plus cc. And it will actually tell me which method of the plus function it's calling. So plus in Julia is just a normal function. It just has a lot of methods defined. In fact, currently it has 184 methods defined. I can also define new methods of plus if I define my own types. And we'll see that later in the course. We can actually look. How do you define the sum of two complex numbers in Julia? It will actually give us a link to the source code. So I'm going to click that link. This takes me to the source code of the version of Julia that I'm running. And it tells me exactly how Julia defines the sum of two complex numbers. So here it is, the sum of a variable called z, which is of type complex, and a w, which is of type complex, is, oh, I'm going to make a new complex number, and I'm going to take the real parts and add them, and take the imaginary parts and add those, and put those inside my complex number. That is the definition of the sum of two complex numbers in Julia. But you'll see that if I now add a real number to a complex number instead, there's a different method that does something different. And actually, if I add them the other way around, I also have to define that. That's another different definition. And you can go and find out what exactly it's doing. So defining types in Julia is a very common thing to do and is very useful. And you see from this notebook that the point is that we can actually make different objects that behave in different ways. They can have different functions that I'm calling, even though internally they might have the exact same information. But I can actually now specify that difference to Julia and allow it to call different functions and do different things.